Good morning, everyone. Thank you for that welcome. And uh, welcome to this new series, which we're kicking off in my favorite book of the Bible, uh, the book of Romans. But we're in chapter 12, focusing on this amazing chapter of Scripture where it all gets very practical, very personal, and very challenging, actually. So I hope you're looking forward to that. And uh, the series is about radical community, about how we are to be transformed. That's the invitation of God to every one of us today, is to be transformed But that transformation happens in community. God has joined us together in order that we might all help each other to be transformed, to be more like Jesus Christ. And uh, to set up this idea, I've uh, got a visual aid with me uh, this morning, and no expense spared, I stole this off a beach uh, somewhere. And I wanted to to just show you this, because actually there's two of them here, because I wanted just to remind you, if you've ever seen something, I don't think that's a beautiful, well, pebble, sort of pebble stroke rock, which I... Uh, we sit on our, these sit on our mantelpiece we're, we're, or on the floor by our fire at home. And they're a little reminder because I found them on a beach and it struck me that, well, it didn't strike me, but it struck me, the thought struck me that, <laughs> uh, that um, this used to be just a lump that fell off a cliff. Uh, a jaggedy, unimpressive, certainly wouldn't have been sitting on our fireplace lump of rock. But what happened to both of these, and it, actually we found these in a kind of gully on the beach where there were thousands of these beautifully rounded pebbles. What happens to those lumps is that they get rolled around under the ocean together, and as they hit into each other, they knock off each other all of the, all of the rough bits, all of the sharp bits, all of the chips off the shoulder, so to speak, and they form out of each other because of the collisions, because of the proximity, because they're in community, they form each other. They transform each other into something quite beautiful. And isn't that how transformation happens in the Christian life? You cannot become a beautiful round pebble from a lump off a cliff on your own. (laughs) And you cannot be transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ on your own. We need each other, even the collisions, in order to become a radical community of transformed people. Amen? So both in the big settings and in the smaller life groups and personal relationships, this series is going to help us learn how can we become transformed through radical community. Now, now that word radical, just to clarify, is not saying, because I, I think when we often use the word, you know, radical, dude, it sort of speaks of something completely different to everything that's come before. That's not what we mean. In fact, that's not what the word means. The word radical comes from a Latin word radix, uh, from which we also get our word radish, which means root, right? The word radical means roots. In other words, this series, Getting Radical, is actually about going back to our roots, and looking in the New Testament at what it actually means to be a community of Christians together. Almost suspending everything that we currently think we know about what it means to be a Christian and asking, if we go back to our roots, what's authentic Christian community meant to look like? And I don't know about you, but the more I've swum in the waters of Western Christianity, and I've been born and raised in that, but then you sometimes you bump up against things in Scripture when you go back to the New Testament, but also you bump up against other Christians from other parts of the world, and it reminds us that Western Christianity is not actually normal Christianity, (laughs) in the sense of it's not the radical, original, roots version of Christianity that God wants us to be transformed by. I was in Vietnam uh, recently, and I was meeting with other leaders from different parts of the continent of Asia and the South Pacific, and when I was there, Uh, I met a couple of different people who really reminded me, their stories reminded me, actually, Christianity is far more radical than this Western, slightly insipid version that I've been so used to. You know, one preamper, he had queued, he's actually quite a senior leader, but he had queued for two days in order to get enough fuel for the conference. And it's just like that radical kindness is so different to our hurried, self-centered, I'm too busy to help Western individualism. But who's closer (laughs) to the New Testament roots? Priyantha or myself? And then I met another beautiful lady called Soma who's from India and she'd been in court because the Hindus had brought a court case against the Christians and she was representing 
Christian organization, and she was in court, but she was warned that Hindu extremists were coming to kill them when they arrived at court. And lo and behold, when the car pulled up outside, there were people there with machetes who were going to kill them. She prays, Soma prays, and reminds of the story of Gideon where they won the battle without any fight. And as they prayed, a deluge of rain just suddenly came, absolute torrent, and when the rains cleared, all their enemies had gone. And she walked into the court, yeah. She walks into the court to defend Christianity. And it's like, that is more like the New Testament than what I'm living, wouldn't you say? I met another guy who was telling me, we need more Bibles for this town where he lives. And I said, why do you need more Bibles all of a sudden? He said, because one of the ladies there who was blind was healed in the name of Jesus. And now it's the talk of the town. It's like, that's normal Christianity, right? In community, doing extraordinary things because, and, and I want to encourage us, you know, God's normal is not the average, right? And what I mean is, I mean, King said, we're part of a church here that is well above average. Whatever Western Christianity is, whatever British Christianity is, we have a privilege of being part of a church that I know for a fact is well above average. But that isn't the same as normal. You're not normal, is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is actually God's got more for this church. Don't settle for just being, well, we're above average. For what? No, no, let's go back to our roots and say, but what's kingdom normal? Maybe it's even more radical than what we're experiencing here, even if we're above average. You know, don't forget averages. That's not, you don't determine what's normal in God's kingdom by what's average. Not at all. We go back to the roots. It's the radix of the whole thing, the radical roots of Christianity. And we're going to do that in Romans 12. So let me read the opening two verses that I'm going to really unpack today with all of that as the series set up in mind. Here we go. Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. A couple of things to unpack from these couple of verses. The first is, based on verse one, we need to make a radical response to God's love. In verse one, Paul invites us, to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. It's a radical, radical devotion, surrender to Jesus Christ. But this only makes sense. He actually says this is your logical or reasonable response. That's what he goes on to say. But this is only logical in view of God's mercy. That's how the verse opens. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... In other words, in the light of, Paul's saying, all that we've looked at in the first 11 chapters of Romans, chapter 12, in response, offer yourselves to God. So let me just remind you, I mean, I, I, in the book I've written on Romans, I use the metaphor of a mountain, like Romans is a great mountain. And you can see the front cover visual here on the screen, and we start the mountain climb right down the bottom in that valley of sin. Romans actually takes us down lower before it takes us up higher to remind us that apart from the grace of God, we're in a difficult place, an impossible place down in the valley of sin, Romans 1 to 3. But by God's grace, through Jesus Christ, we who deserve God's wrath have been raised up to the heights. This is the idea Paul has in view of God's mercy. There's a view. You're in a higher place now. You can see the big picture of what God has done through Jesus Christ. Romans 3, 23, down in that valley, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But Romans 5 goes on to tell us, but God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and raised us up. And Romans 8, I think, is like the summit of the entire Bible, really. It's the high point of Scripture. In Romans 8, we're told it's not just that he's cancelled your debts and forgiven your sins, it's that he's raised you up to have the experience of all that belongs to Jesus Christ. Isn't that extraordinary? It's not just that he's sorted out the negative and left you in a neutral place. He's raised you up to the positive of who Jesus himself is. Paul says in Romans 8 that the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you to give life to your mortal bodies. He's the spirit by whom we cry, Abba, 
Father, and the same Spirit says, and you are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Isn't that extraordinary? I mean, you lot. (laughs) You lot are co-heirs with Jesus Christ. You have as much of an inheritance in God's kingdom as Jesus Christ himself. Wow. In view of God's mercy, Paul says, what is the only logical, reasonable response? If he offered everything to give us everything, if he offered his whole life for us to give us life, then we offer our lives to him. In view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It is actually, when you see what Jesus has done, this response is actually the most logical, rational, reasonable next step. He laid down his life as a sacrifice for me. I'm going to live my life as a living sacrifice for him. Now, what does that actually mean, a living sacrifice? Well, let me mention a couple of things I think are relevant. Firstly, notice it's continual, a living sacrifice. It's not a dead sacrifice offered once. It's a continually offered person, a living slain kind of person is what Paul's saying here. It's the kind of life that never, it is never done with, with offering its whole self to God. No matter how long we've been Christians for, some of us, Every day is another day to present ourselves as living sacrifices, amen? The, 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 the Jewish people reading this would have known what it was once a year to take an animal to the temple and offer it as a sacrifice. And Paul, it's as if Paul's saying what you think in the Old Testament of as once a year, I want you now to think of it as every day, <laughs> a continual. Don't bring a sacrifice, now you are to be the sacrifice, continually offering ourselves to God. And then notice also it's total. It's not just continual, it's total. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. It's interesting that in the Greek world, the body was thought of almost in a negative way, some sort of prison or tomb from which the soul needs to escape. In other words, the only thing precious and valuable are souls and philosophies and ideas that waft around at this level. Everything down on the ground, everything embodied, the Greek gods weren't interested in what you did with your bodies. It was all about your souls. But that's not Christianity. God sent his son to become flesh and blood. He inhabited the body as Jesus of Nazareth, which was, die, which was crucified on the cross and then physically raised to an embodied, eternal, glorious victory. So Christianity is all about bodies. In other words, it's the entirety of my being. God's not just interested in my Sunday. He's interested in every day. He's not just interested in my soul. He's interested in every part, every inch of me, (laughs) the embodied Andrew Ollerton. There is no partition that I can build between things that do matter to God about my life and things that don't. That partition is the problem. It's all an offering to God. It's continual and a total living sacrifice. I love how Eugene Peterson puts it in the message. He says this, take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Everything. I can't uh, capture this better than a piece uh, by a a Christian uh, teacher called Ortiz, and he imagines a conversation between a man who is wanting to buy a pearl, a great pearl, and a merchant who's selling the pearl. Imagine you are this person thinking about buying the pearl. He says this, I want to buy the pearl, how much is it, we ask? And the seller says, well, it's very expensive. Well, how much? A lot. Well, do you think I could buy it, we ask? Oh, yes, says the merchant, everyone can buy it. Well, I thought you said it was very expensive. How how much is it? Everything that you have, says the seller. All right, we decide I'll buy it. Okay, well, what do you have? We look in our phones and say, well, we have about 10,000 pounds in the bank. All right, I'll take that, says the seller. Now, what else? Well, nothing more, really. We rummage around in our pockets. Another 20 quid here. You can have that. Fine, says the seller. What else do you have? Well, that's really all I've got, we say. Well, hang on, where do you live, says the seller. Oh, yes, we live in a house. Right, well, we'll have your house as well. And we reply, well, that means I'll have to live in my camper. Ah, you have a camper. Well, that also becomes mine. Well, then I'll have to go in my car. Ah, you have a car. Two of them both become mine. 
We say to the seller, well, look, you've taken my money, my house, my camper, my car. Where's my family going to live? Ah, you have a family, <laughs> a wife and three kids. They're mine now too. Suddenly the seller exclaims, oh, I almost forgot. You, yourself too, you also become mine. Everything that you have. But then he goes on to explain, now listen, I will allow you to continue to use all these things for the time being, but never forget that they are mine, just as you are. And whenever I need them, you must give them up, because now I am the owner. Whew. That is radical Christianity, is it not? And that, that is the roots of our faith. This is the roots of Jesus Christ who said, come and follow me and give up everything that you have to find life. We are not owners of our lives anymore. We are stewards of that which has been bought out by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but that's where the rubber hits the road. That's where this Western individualism has to think differently. I don't belong to myself anymore. I need to begin every day on my knees. I, I actually physically do this because I just find there's something about physically expressing, reminding Andrew Ollerton on a daily basis, because he, he struggles with this truth, you know, reminding him on a daily basis, you are not your own. You've been bought out at a price. You are a living sacrifice. What, imagine if all of us this week knelt at the start of each day and just recited Romans 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the... What an impact that could have. This is the posture of a living sacrifice that says, in view of God's mercy, all I have is yours. So we make a radical response to God's love, verse one. And just quickly, verse two, just moving on. We have also to make a radical commitment to God's pattern. Did you notice what Paul says in verse two? Having brought us to our knees as living sacrifices, he goes on to say, now, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, there is a pattern to this world. And what Paul's talking about is, the, is not the world in the sort of physical material sense, but the world culture, the environment in which we are doing our Christianity. You know, it's one thing to be a confident Christian in here, but it's a, there's a world out there that is going in a very different direction. And here Paul sets up this juxtaposition. There's the world's pattern or there is God's pattern, the world's way, the world's program, the world's values, or God's. And to be a radical Christian in a radical community is to say, I've decided not to follow the world's way, but I'm going to be conformed not to the world's way, but I'm going to be transformed into God's way. God's pattern is what I will pursue. Now, this is challenging because we don't realize how much pressure we're under day to day in the big wide world to conform to its pattern. The peer pressure, the media pressure, the social media pressure, the, the, the consumerist pressures, the tendency to be so inculcated in a vision that says, I'm my own boss and my great goal in life is to live out my dreams. And I do that my way and that's who I am. And it's like that vision of life is so contrary to God's pattern. And we have a choice to make. Will we be conformed to the pattern of this world or transformed by the renewing of our minds? I imagine what happens to us during the week, a bit like what happened to my son, that we went to the beach just this, this last week uh, with my son and a friend and Charlotte, and we let them go in the sea, and we were sort of sunbathing on the beach, and, um, and there were st quite strong cross currents on the beach. Have you ever had this experience? And they didn't realize, but they were sort of moving down the beach as they were just playing in the water, just slowly, incrementally moving, until eventually they came out about sort of 30 meters up the beach and then ran back up to us saying, why are you moving away from us? <laughs> and we're like, no, no, we've not moved. But have you ever had that experience where you just didn't realize that all the while you were drifting with this invisible 
current that was taken, and I think that's what it's like to be a Christian in this Western post-Christian secular culture, isn't it? There are strong cross-currents at work. There are strong cultural pressures to conform. And too many Christians, and sadly even denominations of Christians, are effectively just drifting with the cultural current. Whatever the world says is progressive, it's like, yeah, that's, that's absolutely what we think as well. Hang on a minute. <laughs> We don't get our values from the world and just baptize them and call them Christian. No, 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 we get our values. We are to be radical, back to the roots, the radix of our faith is that we belong to Jesus Christ. And we're not conforming to the pattern of this world, we're gonna be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Notice the battle is in the mind, amen? Yes, you can applaud that point, because that's just scripture, isn't it? The battle is for the mind. How we think will determine what we do. You know that old saying, how does it go? So a thought, uh, I forget it exactly how it goes now. Hang on a minute. I've got it in my notes somewhere. So a thought and reap an action. So an action, reap a habit. So a habit, reap a character. And so a character, and you'll reap a destiny. But it all begins with a thought the renewing of our minds, how we think about life is not something that we can just drift with the culture and think that's okay. We have to be very deliberate and intentional. I wanna encourage you, you know, I I just find scripture on a daily basis is part of that renewal process. Writing this book on Romans has been so good for me just to get back into the text of Romans. I've decided I'm just gonna read through Romans once a month because I need this vision that you don't get from watching TV (laughs) of what it actually looks like to see myself and the world and the Christian community through the eyes of God. You know, find your space, your book of the Bible, your patch, and just dig some deep roots down into Scripture and let your mind be renewed. Read some good Christian books. Listen to Tim Keller, who's recently just died and has gone to be with the Lord, but listen to his fantastic teaching on how to understand Christianity within a Western secular culture. Immerse yourself in truth and let your mind be renewed in order that we might be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but notice this beautiful thought, transformed by the renewing of our minds. And as we said at the start, this doesn't happen in isolation, remember. This happens in community. As we gather around God's word, as we gather in the spirit, as we pray together and we're honest together and we get close together, we are gonna be transformed, metamorphosed. That's literally the word Paul uses, metamorphosed. It's it's the word for physical, material, essential transformation. To mix metaphors, it's the caterpillar but that has built into them the DNA to become a butterfly. And I want to say when you became a Christian, if you are born again, you have been born again with the DNA spiritually to become transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Literally, Romans 8, Paul says, we have been predestined to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. That is in you but you've got to gather together. We've got to be a people who are on the journey together, immersed in truth, rooted in community, if we are to be transformed. God has high hopes for us caterpillars. (laughs) It is that we might become the butterflies, the beautiful reflections of the image of Jesus Christ. And that, therefore, is the reason why we say to a world around us that does not know this, we will not just go with the flow. We will not just drift and be conformed. The last thing the world around us needs right now is Christians who are no different. (laughs) What our world desperately needs is to see that there is a vision for human transformation and it is rooted in Jesus Christ and the community of his people. Amen? Amen. Well, I want to lead us in a response to this challenge I want to invite you, firstly, will you memorize Romans 12, 1 to 2? And will you say it and meditate on it and marinate your soul in it this week? What a thought that is. I mean, it's not difficult, is it? Some, some believers in past ages would memorize whole books of the Bible. It's just a couple of verses. But memorize these truths and get them into your soul and allow it to be a continual, total, voluntary decision you make on a daily basis. 
But right now, I want to lead us in a moment of decision. And it may be for some of us that we have been caught between things. We've been sort of following Jesus. The picture I had, I want to share with you a picture I felt was prophetic for some of us today. And the picture I had was some of us, we were almost on this mountaintop, beautiful scenery, stunning view. And we were trying to make our way along a path, holding the hand of Jesus, who was there with us. But we brought with us this sort of suitcase, which just looks so out of place. I mean, the sort of suitcase you wheel around an airport, not take up a mountain. And we were trying to bring with us all this other stuff in case things didn't work out with him or in case his plan for our life wasn't the one that we wanted. We were a bit nervous that he might take us to places we didn't really want to go or not fulfill us. So we've brought with us all this other stuff. And did you notice in Romans, Paul says that the will of God is good, pleasing and perfect. And there's a decision to trust Jesus today that if we give him everything, not sort of hedging our bets, holding his hand, but bringing other stuff with us in case this isn't actually what we want after all. You know, you'll never make progress. You'll never be transformed dragging a suitcase over a mountain. <laughs> what a ridiculous thought. I heard as, I, as that suitcase was being pulled, I heard the clunk of bottles of drink. Some of us who've just been relying on other substances to think and thinking we need that to get through life as well as Jesus. No, you don't. No, you don't. He's enough. He's enough. You don't need all of that as well. That's, it's the stuff that you're holding on to that's ruining your life, not him. Amen. I, I felt like I, I heard the clunk of bottles. I, I heard the flutter, the rustle of paper, money, you know. It is just paper. But some of us are so convinced that if we could just get a bit more, then we'd be through to a place where we could really be happy. It's like, no, you'll never get there. And it's the stuff you're holding on to that's holding you back, not him. I saw the, the glimmer of screens, technology, screens and phones and social media and, and plans that we've got. And we're convinced that we know what's best for our future. So we want to follow Jesus, but we're not giving up these plans in case his plan for our life isn't as good as ours. Oh, come on. <laughs> it's not what we hold on to that's holding us back. Sorry, it's what we hold on to that is holding us back, not him. And today's an opportunity just to put that suitcase down and say, do you know what? I don't need that stuff. I need Jesus. And I've decided to follow him and to be a living sacrifice. He's not going to get half of me hedging my bets. I will be a living sacrifice, the whole of me, body and soul offered to him. I feel like the only way to respond to that kind of challenge is to invite us if you would like to and if you physically are able to physically kneel. Because again, I just find there's something about kneeling that just puts us in our place and makes us in a joyful way, servants of the Lord. So maybe you'd like to respond with me. You've been a Christian for many years, but you know that there's something in that suitcase, one of those things or something else that you're trying to bring with you and it's holding you back. Or maybe you want to become a Christian today. You're right on the edge of it. Why don't you kneel with me if you would like to? No pressure, but if you'd like to, kneel with me. And I'd like to lead us in a moment of devotion and surrender. Those of you who physically would like to kneel but perhaps can't, just hold your hands out in front of you and join with those of us who are kneeling. And, and those of you who aren't kneeling, please don't feel any pressure. Just sit and take a moment for yourself. But those of us kneeling, just reach out your hands to the Lord. I wonder what's in your suitcase. This living sacrifice thing, this radical Christianity is continual and it's total. I wonder what you've been holding on to, to hedge your bets and have Jesus plus your plans, Jesus plus your things that you don't want to let go of. Those are the things that are holding you back, never him. Just hold them out to the Lord. Reach out your hands and imagine whatever that stuff is for you and just offer it to him. There's no condemnation right now. We're in Christ Jesus. So he doesn't condemn you, but he wants to take those things from you and release you from the addiction, from the dependency, from the control that you've let those things have, from the fear and the anxiety that it's bred in you. Lord Jesus Christ, we welcome you in this moment of honest response. We don't want to be in such a beautiful place, high up on a mountain, in view of God's mercy, dragging some suitcase around. 
we want to let it go and give all of ourselves to you. Thank you for this safe community, this radical but safe community of God's people here together. We offer our bodies to you. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Thank you, Lord. As we worship together, just perhaps stay on your knees. Simon's gonna lead us in a song, but as we worship, just keep offering yourself to God, continual, and total. And I, I believe as we do this, weights are lifting off people. Heavy suitcases that we've been dragging around. We're going to be released to make new joyful progress in the Christian life as we let these things go. So come Holy Spirit, as we worship now, may it be our true and pleasing response in view of your mercy. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's worship.